Alright guys, how's it going? A few days ago, one or two people sent me a link to Paul Alcorn's article over at Tom's Hardware, The Best CPUs, and this one really did kick off quite a bit of discussion, most notably on the AMD subreddit. 804 comments currently, now simply by taking a look at the 5 CPU choices is a good indicator of why. And after a myriad of posts claiming that Tom's is biased and shilling for Intel, the director of community, Joe Pishkar, decided that he had to respond. That didn't really go down all that well either. And on the article itself at Tom's, there were some pretty harsh comments as well. And in the comments, both Paul and Joe said that they're open to feedback and discussion on their methods. So that's just what I decided to do. Starting off, let's just take a look at the CPU choices here. The cheapest one is, of course, the Pentium G4560. $80 and absolutely no argument there from anybody. AMD's got nothing down at that price range that is even worth consideration. Next up was the i3-7100. This one was a little bit dubious, but I sort of understand what he's done here. It comes in around $115 and had it not been included, there would have been a massive gap between the G4560 and the i5-7500. So something had to go in here and looking at all the other CPUs, there's really nothing there that is worth buying. The i3-7100 is a terrible CPU for the money, but there is literally nothing worth buying below $150 apart from the G4560. The i3's got a bit more turbo and AVX too. It's not worth that. So some people were slightly upset by this, but I fully understand the reasons for why the i3 has been included here. The next two, the i5s, are the ones that I disagree with. And in my R5-1600X review, I said at the end that the i5s were effectively worthless now, at least at their current price points. But I'm going to discuss these two CPUs more using the numbers that Paul has used in order to form his conclusion here. And finally is the i7-7700K, difficult to argue against this one again. The R7-1700 is a very good CPU, but there's no question that the 7700K is just beastly. And if you're a pure gamer, it is still possibly the top CPU to get in most cases. Those eight threads really do make a big difference over the i5. It's very important now to mention that this list is for gamers who want to get the most for their money. And it continues, if you don't play games, then the CPUs on this list may not be suitable for your particular needs. I'm not entirely happy about this if you don't play games thing. I think most people play games. What this should say is, if you do other work, or if you multitask, then the CPUs on this list may not be suitable for your particular needs. Or flip it around and say, if you only play games, then the CPUs on this list are for you. And also very importantly, the criteria to get on this list are strictly price performance, but now it gets a little bit confusing. We acknowledge that there are other factors that come into play, such as platform price or CPU overclockability, but we're not going to complicate things by factoring in motherboard costs. Now, I don't really understand what this means. When they acknowledge stuff like overclocking and platform cost, but they're not factoring in motherboard costs, this doesn't really make any kind of sense to me. The issue here is, of course, we already know that the Intel CPUs overclock that bit better. And in the case of the Ryzen 5 1600X review, from which the i5 numbers in this article have come from, we can see they've got some pretty nice cooling here. They're using an H100 IV2 Corsair water cooling on the i5. And of course, an overclocking motherboard can cost more. This part here does cause a bit of a problem for me because I don't know how you can rate these CPUs on price performance while including overclocking, but not factoring in motherboard cost and the cost of coolers. It doesn't really make sense to me. And of course, there's more to it than that, because recently, these temperature spikes that were reported on the 7700K processors, this was the day before the Tom's article, and on the same day, we learned that Intel's response to this was simply stop overclocking. Overclocking, of course, voids the warranty, unless you want to pay for Intel's protection plan. So this is something that simply has to be taken under consideration. And there is even more to it than that, because over at Tom's, they got 5 gigahertz on their i5. But elsewhere, we've only seen 4.8, 4.9 gigahertz. The overclocking issue is a major problem for me, because it has to be considered or acknowledged, but just how far does that go? Looking through the comments and the review, it certainly does appear that 
Paul has put a lot of emphasis on the i5's 5 gigahertz overclock without taking the additional cost into consideration. And there's even more to be said about overclocking. This is a research paper from Microsoft analyzing hardware failures on a million consumer PCs. It's a nice paper with some interesting information, but what I was most interested in was down at 5.11 identifying an overclocked machine, and I was interested in the numbers. Now, Microsoft was able to identify the rated speed of 477,000 CPUs, so roughly half of the entire sample, and then they measured the actual CPU speed and found that overclocked machines, which for them was actual speed more than 5% faster than the rated speed. So for example, that would be a 4.2 gigahertz overclock on a CPU which had a normal stock speed of 4 gigahertz. Microsoft discovered that only 2% of machines were overclocked. 2% of this 477,000 number, and that was including overclocks of only 5% faster. So you can probably imagine that the number of i5-7600Ks running at 5 gigahertz is extremely low. What exactly this means we should do with overclocking results, I simply don't know. But one thing for sure that has to be done, if you're going to include 5 gigahertz 7600K results, then you simply have to consider the extra cooling cost and the extra motherboard cost. Quick and dirty check over at Amazon, we can find B350s for $80, while the cheapest Z270 appears to be $109. Now that is almost $30 difference. And while I understand that they don't want to complicate things by factoring in motherboard costs, that $30 here is the difference between winning and losing. But let's have a look at the article, some of the comments, while also taking a look at the numbers. Right, so looking at the guts of the article, Paul says that the 1600X offers a great performance per dollar ratio compared to Intel's competing chips in heavy threaded workloads, like rendering and content creation. But like the 7 series, it can't quite match KB Lake's convincing lead in a diverse range of game titles. Now, Paul had responded to questions in the comments, noting that they haven't yet tested the 1600 or 1400, though they are in the process of doing so. But far more interesting, he shows a chart outlining the current price versus performance positioning of the AMD and Intel lineups. And what they've done is taken a geometric mean of the average FPS in the entirety of their game suite and plotted this against the cost of each relative processor. And we've even got a link. So here is Paul's gaming price efficiency chart. Bottom right corner is the best. And here we can see the R5-1600X with the i5-7600K that little bit ahead. Now we can see here that on the average FPS, the 1600X should be just below 85, with the 7600K around the 86 FPS mark. And in fact, I put all of his numbers into my own spreadsheet and I got an average FPS of 84.4 for the 1600X and 86.6 for the 7600K a percentage difference of only 2.6%. Again though, that was with both at stock. Looking at the overclocked values, the 7600K at 5 gigahertz appears to be around about the 98 frames per second mark, with the R5-1600X at 4 gigahertz just below 90. The R5's numbers look a little bit out to me, as I did in fact get 90.3 average FPS. It's not going to make a massive difference, and it wouldn't have made any difference to the conclusion. But the i5-7600K overclocked to 5 gigahertz is 8.8% faster than the R5-1600X, overclocked to 4 GHz. Now again, it can't quite match Cabulate's convincing lead in a diverse range of titles. In actual fact, at stock speeds, the 1600X won in Ashes of the Singularity, won in Civilization VI, won in Deus Ex Mankind Divided, and won in Hitman, which is 4 out of the 10 games. I really wouldn't call that a convincing lead in a diverse range of game titles. But once the i5 is overclocked to 5 gigahertz, the 1600X only wins in Deus Ex. Now scrolling down to a later comment by Paul, when talking about the 1600X, he does say that there is value in having more threads. And in the future, it will likely come in handy. However, many of the same things have been said in the past, and we haven't seen it come to fruition. Now, we'll get to that part soon. But right at the bottom, he also says it's really hard to recommend a processor that is more expensive yet lags the competition by roughly 15%. Now, looking at my numbers again, the only way he could possibly get to 15% is by using the overclocked i5 numbers against the stock 1600X numbers, which comes in around 16% faster. So it does appear he's made a bit of an error here, which could have coloured his conclusion. Even if he's taken the overclock numbers, the i5 should have been 8.8% faster, and certainly not 15%.
Now here's a chart of all the numbers. This one is at stock speeds, and as you can see, it really is all pretty tight. Win some, lose some. In most cases, except for Rise of the Tomb Raider. Now I'm pretty sure you know where this one's going. Paul has used a GTX 1080 and has come up with a Tomb Raider benchmark where the i5 wins by around 44%. I have not seen this kind of win anywhere else, but by this stage, I'm gonna assume that you're watching this, Paul, and probably Joe as well, and my guess would be that you haven't seen my Rising of the Tomb Raider video, where I do a massive amount of benchmarking on Tomb Raider with a very interesting conclusion. And that conclusion was that Ryzen and Nvidia's drivers do not mix well. And another poster had noted this, as well as some other issues. For example, in Battlefield 1, Paul has only tested DX12. It appears that Ryzen runs better in DX11 once again. And we've seen this on multiple sources. And the same poster also mentioned that Rise of the Tomb Raider had a bit of a broken benchmark, at least in DX12. So Paul responds and says, we're going to test Tomb Raider in DX11 for the next round of benchmarks. But the real point here is, of course, Tomb Raider is a flawed benchmark. So if you just remove that one game out of the 10, and with its massive 44% win for the i5, even using a geometric mean over 10 games, it still skews the results so much that it actually makes the difference between winning and losing. If you simply remove Rise of the Tomb Raider, then at stock speeds, the R5-1600X actually wins the benchmark suite. Over those nine games, the R5-1600X would be 1.2% faster than the i5-7600K. It does change around again when both are overclocked. The i5-7600K now only wins by 5.9% though, which is down on the previous 8.8%. Stuff like this is why I constantly rail against outliers. I dislike outliers. In this case, it's just unfortunate. Nvidia's driver just does not work well with Ryzen, especially in this game. Right, so now I'm gonna move on to the part which, to me, is the part that really matters here and is the part that needs to be clarified. One person mentioned that $250 processors along with 1080s, 1080 Ti's doesn't make an awful lot of sense. And Paul's reasoning in his response was, graphics bottlenecks are not good for quantifying performance over time. Fair enough. And many of our readers are rocking five-year-old processors, so they expect some sustainability as GPU technology improves. Now, of course, I went over this in my Tech Press Loses the Plot video, and then followed up with my Benchmarks What to Trust video. But clearly what we're looking at here is another instance where somebody in the press believes that testing with faster graphics cards today is an indicator of future performance. And again, a little further down, he agrees that in the future, more threads will likely come in handy. However, the same thing has been said in the past and we haven't seen it come to fruition, at least not entirely. And then again later on, more threads are beneficial, no doubt, but per core performance is hard to beat in games, which are still primarily lightly threaded. Bear in mind, it's five years later, and most games are still not fully leveraging multi-core architectures. But this is simply not the case. If you look at the 10 games that Paul tested, the 1600X wins in most of the new titles. A win in Ashes, it does lose in Battlefield 1, but that one is a dubious win for the i5. The 1600X wins in Civilization 6, it wins in DSX, it wins in Hitman, it's a draw in the division. Again, you've got another i5 dubious win in Rise of the Tomb Raider. The i5 only wins in the older games like Project Cars, which was 2015, Shadow of Models or Draw, and Grand Theft Auto, which is of course 2015 on the PC, but really based on a 2013 console title. All of these 2016 games exhibit very good multi-threading, so it's no surprise that the 1600X is doing well. The big problem with Tom's benchmarks, again, the Rise of the Tomb Raider result, and the older games, Project Cars and Grand Theft Auto V, exhibit very good wins for the i5. If you're going to keep throwing in these older games into the mix, which do tend to favour strong per core performance, then yes, you're going to see the i5 winning. Even with geometric means, looking at some of the overclocked results here, look at the Project Cars result again once it's overclocked, and Grand Theft Auto V as well. So games for sure are more multi-threaded, and they will simply become even more multi-threaded moving forward. Obviously this poster had seen my video, and Paul went on to talk about the FX and 2500K, seemingly under the belief that the 2500K was winning by around 20% in average frame rate. And then a little further down, we actually find out that he has seen my video. Over at Anantech, at PC Games Hardware, at the Tech Report, at Computer Base, they all showed the same thing. Sandy Bridge had lost ground to Bulldozer, 
because games became more multi-threaded, those four cores started becoming a liability. This is the really important part here, Paul, because as another poster said, he was curious as why you were ignoring the CPU utilization percentages, which if you were checking, would clearly show that in a lot of these cases, the i5 was completely maxed out. Now, in my R5-1600X video, I showed this near the end, where in Ashes of the Singularity, Fallout 4, I believe, Hitman, Doom, and Tomb Raider, especially in Tomb Raider, in fact, we could see that the i5 was completely maxed out. And what's more, in recent Tom's Hardware gaming articles, where they used an i5, was it a 6500? I'm not sure. But they used an i5 anyway, showing that in Ghost Recon Wildlands, the i5 was frequently maxing out. We can see with the orange bar, 96 to 100% load, and the rest of the time it was between 81 and 95% load. And also in Mass Effect Andromeda, where more than half of the time, almost two thirds of the time, the CPU was completely maxed out. You might not be able to tell in the future, but stuff like this should make you think long and hard about buying a 4-core, four 4-thread four CPU compared to a 6-core, 12-thread CPU. Right, so to finish this one up, you've taken a bit of stick here, Paul, and people calling you biased, and Tom's Hardware as well. But for me, this is not about bias. I don't know for sure. I can't imagine why anybody would be biased towards Intel. Whether or not there's money changing hands, I really don't think so either. But for me, I don't believe Paul is biased. For the simple fact is, throughout his 1600X review, he tested the 1600X with SMT off and SMT on. And looking at all of the numbers, it appears that he has always chosen the best result. A slight blip maybe with the overclocked results, but in the non-overclocked results, in every case, Paul has chosen the best result for the R5-1600X, whether that means SMT on or SMT off. That is something that I would not have done, because this is the sort of stuff that I simply would not do, and most people wouldn't do either. If Paul was biased, he would have been more than justified in not doing that. And the result for the 1600X would look a lot worse. So no, not a case of bias. The basic issue here is this. You've got a list for gamers who want to get the most for their money, but that's not exactly what it does. Everybody's different. Paul clearly puts a lot into overclocking. The vast majority of people do not. And this has been the first issue here because when not overclocked, the Ryzen 5 1600X is basically faster than the i5 today, and it will continue to be even faster in future. At 5 GHz though, no question the i5 still hangs in there, even in the newer titles. However, its victory seems to have come from pulling away further in the older titles, which should be getting replaced sooner rather than later, with games that are more highly threaded. And this was another issue, because yes, games are clearly becoming way more multi-threaded. We're at a tipping point here. Recommending an i5 today is like recommending a dual core five years ago. Let's call it a dual core Ivy Bridge. Would you have recommended an Ivy Bridge Pentium over a Sandy Bridge i7? Because this is kind of like what it looks like. Four threads against 12. The R5 is massively more powerful CPU. And this belief that by using a GTX 1080 to show how future proof the i5 is, in actual fact, it is the exact opposite. Just look at the years of the game titles. You can clearly see that Ryzen is winning the newer games with the faster GPU. And it's gonna pull away with even faster GPUs and even more highly threaded games. It's the exact opposite of what you believe will happen. It's gonna happen. Like you said, some people are using five-year-old CPUs. Recommending an i5 today to last five years? when you've got the R5 choice instead, simply does not make sense to the vast majority. And yes, I have seen other websites like PC Perspective and others recommending that people still buy the i5. That's fine, they can go ahead and do that. The recommendations are simply short-sighted. And for me, that's the biggest crime about this article. It's short-sighted, but you're not alone because the vast majority of the tech press is incredibly short-sighted. I don't mind saying that because I know that within a year or two, the R5 is gonna be faster than the i5. There may actually be an element of some in the press believing that choosing the i5 is the safe option, but it isn't. The R5 is the safe option. It's basically on par today with almost no chance of it getting worse going forward. There's only one way that this can go, and I'm pretty sure that the next Tom's Hardware Best CPUs article will reflect this. Right, so I'm done with this one. Very difficult video. Feels like it's taken forever and I'm kind of lacking motivation right now. I can't even get excited for Vega, but maybe just a phase I'm going through. We'll see what the rest of the month holds though. There's something slightly different coming before the end of the month. I'll catch you later guys. Thank <laughs> you.